there you go, Alex. All right, great, thanks, Dylan. Um, so welcome everyone to our um, webinar on dental health. Um, really, again, this is guidance for um, families with kiddos with special needs. We know that um, it can be, going to the dentist can be a little bit challenging and even um, caring for teeth um, can be challenging for, um, for these kiddos and for adults um, as well. So um, this presentation um, is a partnership and we'll talk and give credit to those that um, really helped create this training at the end. Uh, but I think it really does a nice job of giving some nice tips, um, you know, as you're going forward and, and getting established and, and helping your um, loved one take care of their teeth. So um, again, I am Allison Wiest. I am a parent trainer with Maine Parent Federation. I have been with Maine Parent Federation, um, I believe since 2017 initially as a family support navigator. Um, we will mention that program at the end um, as well. And then more recently, um, for the last couple of years, I've been a parent trainer with Dylan. I am also the parent of a 11-year-old um, boy who turned 11 recently, so I have to stop and think, 11-year-old boy with an autism diagnosis. Um, so that's a little bit about me. And I'll turn it over to my colleague, Dylan. You want to introduce yeah, yourself? Thank you, Allison. Uh, so hi, everyone. I'm Dylan Campbell, um, and I'm the youth coordinator um, and also a parent trainer here at Maine Parent Federation. Um, I've also been around with the agency since about 2017, uh, primarily working a lot with young people around transition and self-advocacy. Um, I am not a parent, uh, but I do have multiple siblings uh, with, with disabilities, and we've kind of navigated life together with that. Um, so although we're not an expert on like dental health, I think we have lots of experience in, in lots of teeth. Um, but um, thank you for being here today. I did want to mention February is Children's Dental Awareness Month. Um, so that's why we chose this webinar today. Um, and uh, yeah, again, thank you for being here. So uh, let's jump in. Um, I did post in the chat box, hopefully was everyone was able to get it, um, a copy of today's uh, slides. Uh, I also wanted to note that we are not a legal service agency, so really think of all this information today as public service announcement. It's general information for you. So let's dive in. What exactly will we be talking about today? Um, so this is really going to be um, a broad overview on dental health for parents of children with disabilities. So at first, we're going to look at the basics. So at home oral health care. Um, and a lot of this will probably be, you know, maybe a refresher for you. Um, but then we're going to dive into some of those brushing challenges and accommodations. Um, and we have a great list of tools for you as well um, that we want to share with you. Towards the end, we're also going to prepare for the first dental visit, and that's where we're going to dive into a, a couple of uh, short clips from a video, um, and then we have a plan that we're going to give to you today. Um, and then we will wrap it up with some useful resources and questions. Um, so with that, I think uh, it's over to you, Allison. Thanks, Dylan. So I, as Dylan mentioned, we're going to start with talking about at-home oral care. Um, again, that's where it starts, and we're really going to start right at the basics. So on the next slide. So again, we want to start thinking about caring um, for the teeth at when our, our uh, loved one is a baby. So again, our infant, um, I think a lot of times we don't always think about this because maybe they're uh, nursing or they're bottle feeding. But as soon as teeth begin to arrive, we want to start taking care of them. So really using just a clean, wet cloth or gauze to wipe the, the teeth down and the gums down twice daily, just like if we were um, if they were brushing their teeth, so morning and night, and really keeping those teeth and gums and the inside of the mouth as clean as possible. And again, you're starting to get the child used to having that sensation in the mouth too. I think that's another important um, point to make. So after the teeth start to arrive, continue wiping the child's mouth, um, you know, as much as possible. Use start to use a soft bristled child sized toothbrush with water. Um, again, just starting at the basics, getting them used to having a toothbrush. Um, water is um, excellent again for just sort of removing um, any, um, you know, any acid or sugars or anything else um, build up on the teeth. So important to do that. And then always ask a dentist about um, adding fluoride to a baby's diet. Um, fluoride does um, help to prevent cavities and make teeth stronger. But again, always consulting 
um, with a dentist before you start doing that. So um, initially parents should be the ones applying the toothpaste on the toothbrush. Um, this is a great little diagram um, about how much to use. So just a tiny smear for children under the age of three um, is sufficient. Um, as they get older, um, children ages three to six, it's a little bit bigger, like a pea size. Um, so it, using too much, believe it or not, um, can be harmful. It can cause staining to the teeth. Um, so again, it really is important to not use too much um, toothpaste and also really making sure that the toothpaste isn't left on the teeth. Um, we have a note here about if a child cannot spit, and I can relate to this because my, my son, he still struggles um, with getting all of, you know, just spitting to get all of that out. So again, um, I have him swish, um, but then I also will wipe the teeth down just to make sure that there's no leftover um, fluoride toothpaste and excess on the teeth because it will um, create some staining to their teeth. So again, just being mindful of that. And then flossing is super important as well. Um, and I know I, you know, again, this can be challenging for some kiddos, um, you know, especially who have sensory issues within their mouths. I actually have, um, I use and I'll read this slide in a minute, but I use it on a little handle. Um, I don't know if we have a picture of it in this uh, presentation or not, but it's a little flosser with a handle because again, when I try to get in there and floss my son's teeth, he wants to clench down, he wants to bite. So this handle, it works great. And I will tell you too, because he's at the age of losing a lot of teeth. So we've seen the tooth fairy like six times in the last two months. Um, it's a great little tool to really, if the tooth is wiggly and loose, I can put the, the, um, floss in there on the handle and pull it and the tooth comes right out. So it's a great little, uh, uh tool to have as well. Um, but again, flossing is so important because the toothbrush does not get in between the teeth and there's certain, um, you know, areas that the, the toothbrush just can't get into. Um, it really helps to remove any food or germs that are in between teeth. Um, on the gum line, really preventing disease and cavities, um, and really helping, again, my son just turned 11. Um, this is not something that he's independent with yet, um, so it can be challenging for some kiddos, so really making sure, um, you know, he participates in the brushing of his teeth, but I follow up to make sure that it's done in a, in a way that is satisfactory and going to keep his teeth healthy, um, and again, flossing, um, at least once or possibly twice a day and starting that flossing process as soon as possible so that they, again, they really get used to um, having that in their mouth and, and participating in that process. So healthy teeth, happy teeth. Um, again, we don't always think about this, but dental health is so crucial to overall health. Um, it really, um, recently had a um, doctor appointment for my son. And one of the questions she asked was about his, um, you know, what's going on in his mouth. So whether we realize it or not, our dental health is really important to our overall health. So, um, and again, as we're thinking about, um, you know, our younger kiddos or, you know, kids with disabilities, um, it is tricky because maybe they might have um, preferences to certain things that they want to eat or drink. Um, and getting them to, um, number one, you know, eat healthier foods that are, um, you know, safer or healthier for their teeth, and then also caring for their teeth can be challenging. But here are some, um, you know, some tips to really help with that. Um, juice and milk only during mealtime. Um, my son does love um, juice. Um, and it's not just at mealtime. He does get it at other times during the day, but I really water it down. So it's water with just like a little hint of juice. So just that he has a little bit of flavor in there, um, because I do find it's hard to keep him hydrated if it's just water. Um, but again, limiting as much of that, um, juice and milk, because there are a lot of sugars in that, um, water always being the best option if, um, your child is willing to drink water, um, this is interesting. Um, do not brush after eating or drinking acidic um, items, foods, which is interesting to me because I'd be like, okay, like you brush after a meal and you get rid of all that. The recommendation is to actually rinse with water. 
Um, so rinsing really well to get the acid off the teeth um, because again, acid causes erosion and um, the brushing can uh, not necessarily remove all of that. So rinsing first and then waiting, I believe it says uh, in the notes one minute and then brushing afterwards. So rinsing is always great because rinsing gets um, a lot of that off of the teeth. Um, Again, in the next one, if brushing isn't an option, always rinsing with water. If you don't have a toothbrush, just rinsing as much as possible or wiping the teeth down. Um, only water after the nighttime brushing. So again, um, you have your kiddo brushing before they go to bed. And then if they decide they wanna have a snack or some juice to drink, then that means we have to brush again. So just water afterwards. Avoiding sticky and gummy snacks, again, um, that um, is more difficult to get off the teeth. It can get trapped in there. So um, again, with my son, we don't really do anything sticky or gummy at all. Um, and then reducing sugary foods. Again, sugar acid on the teeth, we know creates cavities um, and erosion. So eliminating that as much as possible. Um, and then um, encourage healthy snacks. Again, challenging, right? Um, I know it's challenging in my household. My son is not a huge um, raw vegetable lover, um, but again, trying to um, introduce healthy snacks as much as possible, um, even fruit. Fruit has sugar in it, but again, it's a, um, it's a healthier um, sugar. Um, and again, rinsing after, um, after eating um, any types of food, rinsing with water um, to remove any sugar or acid that's on there. Um, and then just another note here that milk does contain calcium and helps keep, te helps keep teeth and bones strong. So milk is important, um, but again, just making sure that we're removing um, any of the residue, any of the sugars from the milk from the teeth. Um, so I think that I covered everything. I think, you know, again, the thing to think about again is just keeping the overall health clean, knowing that sugar, um, you know, the drinks that our kids drink. Um, and my son drinks a lot during the day. Um, again, if it stays on the teeth can create problems, really making sure that we're keeping a natural pH level in our teeth, that our, our mouth is not um, overly acidic and that we're not eating a lot of um, sugary drinking and eating a lot of sugary foods. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else, Dylan, that I didn't mention? No, I slide? think you covered all okay. that, that really okay. well. Um, and I think, uh, you know, kind of diving into that, it's, it's really, you know, a lot about just keeping that, those, building those skills when you're young, so we can lead to a healthy mouth, um, mm -hmm. you know, all throughout their, their life. Um, but sometimes, you know, it's, it's not as, 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 you know, simple as, as that. Sometimes there's challenges and, and we need to come up with accommodations for that. Um, so here are some of the recommendations that um, were gathered for us. Um, I don't know if we mentioned that at the beginning, but this training was developed in partnership with um, the Partnership for Children's Oral Health of Maine, um, as well as the University of New England dental students. Um, and we have a slide recognizing the students towards the end. Um, but these are really their recommendations um, as, you know, aspiring dental, um, dental uh, professors professionals. Um, so sometimes reflexes can be a barrier to, you know, maintaining the, the a cleanly mouth. So with certain condi conditions, natural infant reflexes can persist throughout the life. So this may cause brushing challenges. So um, it sometimes may not be that a child is, is just refusing. It can be a lot of overstimulation. Sometimes these reflexes, um, you know, can still pertain throughout life. Um, so uh, this is, gonna, is also going to be a theme that we mention a lot, but for a lot of these, we want you to contact your providers. So we want uh, occupational therapists, speech, dental providers to really learn about your child's condition and, and discover these new techniques that can help your child, you know, accommodate for these brushing needs. So sometimes there are, are different tools that you can do um, to, to, you know, combat that. So, um, you know, thinking about the reflex there, um, that might be an area that you would want to avoid in the mouth. And a lot of time, this could be on the tongue. So um, if you're brushing, maybe maybe for some individuals, avoiding the tongue um, for the primary part of the brushing 
session can, can reduce a lot of that gag reflex. So determine where it really is on the tongue. And it might be in a different you know, part of the tongue, in the back or in the front. And you can do that by using um, a tongue depressor and starting at the tip of the tongue, using the handle and you know, kind of moving around to, uh, to find where there's different pressure sensitive areas. Um, and, and those are areas that you could avoid when, when brushing your, your, your young person's mouth. You know, other tips you want to also give out is, is really think of different ways that might work for you and your individual. So kind of like what Allison had mentioned in the beginning, those flossers with the handle, those really work for her situation and her family. Um, that may not work for everyone. Um, so, so kind of using what is available to you. Um, some individuals may not like toothpaste, may, may be allergic to some of the ingredients, or just may find many of the flavors, you know, not good. So maybe you could find a flavor that they enjoy. Um, and, and sometimes in the case, in the absence of, of tooth, you know, paste, still brushing with, with water can still um, be a good alternative as well. Um, so uh, keeping spare toothbrushes nearby if they are grabby um, and like, you know, want to help. So, uh, you know, still having them involved, you know, depending on the individual, and then, you know, still using that washcloth Allison had mentioned, um, I'll be honest, that was never anything that I had thought about when I first learned about this training and we started doing this. But, you know, using that folded washcloth as an inexpensive tool to really help, you know, prop the, the you know, individual's mouth open. Um, and then we're also going to go through here, but there's also adaptive toothbrushes as well. So sometimes a standard toothbrush just may not be at the right angle, especially if you are an individual helping your young person brush their teeth. Um, it, it can also be a challenge there. Um, I did want to mention we're not sponsored by any of these, but these were some recommended tools that were given to us. Um, and so the first one here is a Chewy, tube, uh, Chewy Tubes Oral Motor Tool. Um, and we do have the links there for, for that. But the concept of this tool is to really provide a chewing surface, um, you know, an, a, an area that is, you know, food safe, um, but they can practice those biting and chewing skills. Um, and that can help strengthen the jaw, um, you know, muscle skills, um, and, and really be over be be good for the overall general oral health. Um, this is something that can be really great for all ages. Um, and this is, you know, helping stimulate the gums. So a nuke massage bread brush is is one brand of it, but it's a soft brush that really um, you know, is used to like, you know, per, apply sensitive pressure um, to the gums and it helps stimulate blood flow. Um, so these can be great for for children who are orally defensive or hypersensitive to food textures, and it can help um, help get them used to um, used to different textures in the mouth as well. Um, and uh, that can also be a great introdu introductory tool um, to a toothbrush to help help getting them used to having that, that toothbrush feel. This is another similar tool, um, but it's a vibrating chewing tool, and it's it's still for uh, you know uh, sensory desensitized desensitization, um, but it helps develop jaw strength and chewing rhythms as well. Um, this was one that I thought was rather fun, um, was multi-sided bristle toothbrushes. So there's all these different models, and this can be really helpful for getting your young person to, to be the individual brushing their teeth. So some of these toothbrushes may have, you know, two heads on it. So this one right here is kind of angled towards the tooth. And then this one over here, they have three. So it kind of gets all around the tooth. So sometimes that can be an option um, as well. And um, I'll be honest, I wasn't aware of many of these options. Um, but then another one you could do is adapting a regular toothbrush you already have. So there are handles you can buy to just put onto a toothbrush um, to make it easier to hold. Um, or you could, you know, DIY a toothbrush, you know, whether using an elastic band um, or this one right here, there's some instructions for uh, using a tennis ball. Um, so having a grip like that can often be, be helpful for, you know, holding the toothbrush and being able to angle it in the right parts of the mouth uh, to, to clean your teeth. Um, a couple other, uh, you know, tidbits and tooth tips is, um, you know, generally a toothbrush sh should be soft. Um, and that goes back to not wanting to scratch the enamel. Um, generally, a bigger handle is easier to use. Um, you know, keep fresh. You know, you want to replace that toothbrush. Um, and then this is a, a general theme that we've heard a lot lately is if your child can go electric, go electric. Um, because that helps, you know, desensitize, uh, desensitize and, and stimulate the gums at a much higher level uh, than a manual toothbrush as well. Um, Something we haven't touched base on is water flossers, and those are really nifty tools like water pick, you know, and it, it you know, 
pushes water at a high pressure speed between the teeth. That can be a great alternative um, if, if you know, traditional flossing isn't. Um, water flossers also have their own additional, uh, you know, sensory things that come with that. And again, we want to encourage to use a fluoride toothpaste, but keeping in mind what Allison had mentioned at, you know, a, an appropriate amount. Um, and gel toothpaste can also be a great alternative if that, you know, gritty, normal toothpaste might not, you know, might not be a fit for your individual. So, I was just going to mention, oh, sorry, Dylan. No, sorry, you're Dylan. good. Um, no, I was just going to say too, like just from my own experience, like, um, you know, initially we started out with a, with different types of toothbrushes. And again, I think it is finding the right fit. Now that my son is older, the electric toothbrush is awesome. And the thing that I love about it is that he can, now that he's older, he can sort of pick out his own. Like a lot of the electric toothbrushes, right? You can go to Walmart or Walgreens or something. And like right now he's into Frozen. So he has an Elsa electric toothbrush. Before that, it was like a Buzz Lightyear. And so um, so again, like having him be a part of picking out his toothbrush, um, he gets to pick it out. He's excited to have Buzz Lightyear brush his teeth tonight. And so, um, you know, again, I think that that, again, thinking about electric toothbrushes, um, he loves the vibration, but he also loves the fact that he can have his very favorite character on his toothbrush. And we also do use, he is definitely a chewer um, and has some uh, oral sensitivities and stuff. So some of these tools that Dylan just went over, um, you know, he always has some sort of a, a chewing uh, jewelry. He has like some jewelry, which is like jewelry that hangs off his neck that he can chew throughout the day. But he utilizes, utilizes a lot of those tools. So um, again, I just wanted to mention that. But, yeah, um, no I love the electric is. toothbrush with the with the characters on them, it works for him. So keeps keeps it interesting for sure. And they're timed as well. So it's a great, you know, helps build the sense of time of how long should you brush. So yes. uh, a lot of them will will beep when they're well, not beep, but vibrate when they're uh when they're there. So um as we dive into uh oh sorry, uh Allison. Um no, just, it's okay. I'll let you dive in. I know you had to ask me about sharing a parent story. Um, and I'm happy to do that whenever you want me to do it. So I yeah, I was just gonna get us there and then hand okay. it to you. So uh, yeah, feel free to to um you know yeah share that story about the first time. I, I remember my first time. It was a lot, but uh... <laughs> the going to the dentist can be really scary for a lot of people. Like people have fears of going to the dentist. And again, if we have kiddos that not only might have a disability, but I know for my son has high anxiety, um, it can be really challenging. So, um, you know, again, my son has been, so my son is 11. We established, I think the recommendation is to establish a, a dentist by like the age of one. I don't believe that he had a dentist at the age of one. I'll be honest. I think it was like two or three before we um, developed the dental home, but I'll be honest with you. Like we have a wonderful dentist. There are dentistries in um, our state. I know um, the one we go to in Portland, they really specialize in working with kiddos um, with disabilities and special health care needs. So they are fantastic. And, and initially, you know, they helped us with the social stories. We had a social story about going. Um, the office is so inviting and fun. The staff is like, very um, patient and explaining and comforting. And, um, you know, granted, it wasn't, um, it was challenging for him initially to sit still, to have somebody put things in his mouth. Um, and so I think the way we navigated that was initially he was going, um, you know, more often to the dentist, again, to get used to going to the dentist, we go to the dentist and this is what we do. We go slow, you know, they would go slow. Um, and um, again, now he, goes to the dentist and he's pretty much a rock star. He really is. He's come a long, long way. So um, again, I think it's that like preparation, providing them with the social story, finding a dentist um, that is a good fit for your child is so important. Um, they they know, the child knows what to expect that they have. Maybe, maybe you bring them to visit even before the actual appointment. Um, and again, um, I think just having, I know for my son, having those um, appointments a little bit closer together and more often also help to sort of like 
um, set him more at ease and desensitize him to like, oh my gosh, I'm going to the dentist. Um, and like I said, now he um, he does really, really well at the dentist. So um Share that. Yeah, that's it's it's there's a lot of like you know new smells and you know sounds mm -hmm. in this office drills buzzing in the background, um so it can it can take a, a you know a moment to to get you know comfortable with that. Absolutely. So um thank you for that, Allison. Um that leads in perfectly to this next piece here. Um and I'm gonna also drop a link here in the chat box. Um this is a video that you guys can watch. Um outside of the, the class here, uh, class training, um, and uh, you can uh, view it. It's about 24 minutes long, but we're only gonna show two small clips for it today. Um, but where this starts off, um, just to give you a bit of context, is she had um, you know attended a ski resort, and when she got there, they were really you know adaptive and accommodating for all their needs. They had a form to fill out, um, whether, you know, what types of sensory items to avoid, um, what type of accommodations that they could they could bring for the event. And she thought, hey, this is great. So she was a dental assistant and decided, let's bring this back to our office because that model could really work for, for us. Um, so here's a, a, a couple of short little videos, and then we have um, the plan that we'll go through. So uh, please let me know if this works, Allison. Bringing our son skiing for a full day. He was going to spend a full day in a ski school when he was young. They had me fill out about a five-page docu document asking mm. me what does he like to eat, when he wants to use the bathroom, what does he say, all these things. And I got so excited because I thought, they get it. Yeah. They understand that every what? kid who can't communicate real well right. is going to have different likes and dislikes, mm -hmm. and they want to learn True. about my kid. And I was, I, all I could think of was he's going to have such a successful day because yeah. of this. So right. immediately it hit me why don't we do this in dentistry and in medicine? Right. Why don't we take time to have families complete a form? So I've actually developed what's called a patient information form, mm -hmm. but there are, again, many of these forms that other hospitals and doctor's offices have developed on their own, mm -hmm. and it is basically just a great way to learn about each individual person who may not be able to communicate those things very well. Mm -hmm. Or maybe the family doesn't have an opportunity to communicate them because, again, we show up at the appointment yeah. and they can't possibly ask us all those questions in the amount of time that right. they have to yeah, treat impossible. our kid. So impossible. this form, I encourage dental and medical doctors to send that form to the family, have the family fill that out and complete it, and hopefully they have that phone call mm. before the next appointment and they have an opportunity to go through that form with the family and boy, they really set themselves up for success that way. Even if it's little things that they find out, like he loves the SpongeBob toothpaste. Mm -hmm. Well, then yeah. they, they're gonna have the SpongeBob right. toothpaste there when that yeah. person comes back right. in. Um, so great way to learn individually how mm -hmm. to have success with all different types of people. Mm -hmm. Typical people, we're all different, but we can communicate those things. Mm -hmm. uh, some mm -hmm. general things are they really look at ways to reduce the sensory input, right? Think mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. all that sensory input when you're at a dental, dental visits even more than medical visits. Mm -hmm. You know, they lay you back in that chair and they haven't even turned the dental light on and what's in your eyes, yeah, light. the fluorescent lights, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. right? The smell. Yeah, when when we first started dating, he used to say to me all the time when I would come home, you smell like a dental office. Yeah. You know, there's a certain smell <laughs> is, yeah. to a dental office that you don't smell at right, home, right? right? So here's our kids. There's these lights in their eyes. There's this weird Strange smell. Smells, yeah. What are the sounds you hear in a dental office that you don't hear? Yeah, drills. The, the drills with the high pit, yeah. <laughs> The suction, Electric, the suction right? Yeah. Another kid in the other room crying, right? right? Yeah. Um, so then there's all that coming in, all that sound. Uh, taste, right? What is the dentist wearing on his hands that mm. most people who are, even if it's someone who needs their teeth taken care of, mm. caregivers may not always be wearing gloves. Right. I don't wear gloves when I take care of my own child's I, teeth. Right. I have to say that um, I find sometimes when I go to a dentist's office, and Amy's been there, especially when Brent was younger, um, Amy's got a very calming way about her. And Brent would be much calmer if the parent stays calm. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important to mm -hmm. it, you know. And You're right. What do they do for parents to make sure that that is 
Already um, what I've said, Mike, imagine if yeah. you had an opportunity to talk to that provider yeah. before you got there that day. Right. Your behavior would be so different mm. when you got there because you'd know what the plan was. Mm -hmm. You would have already been able to ask all your questions, mm -hmm. state all of your concerns, right. have all of that addressed, right? Mm -hmm. So immediately that's going to change the way you behave yeah. when you get there. So a lot of these things work in mul multiple ways to help to help that That's person right. but but so doctors and dentists really need to learn how to reduce all that input mm. all that yeah. sensory input so you know doctors wear headlamps they don't need mm -hmm. to have a big dental That's light true. or any overhead light yep. they could use um, white noise machines that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah. that you're not hearing all the other sounds or allow you know I, I know children like to wear sometimes children with autism like to wear something that drowns out the sounds yeah, you the see headphones. people on airplanes yeah. wearing those mm -hmm. so those Noise could cancel. be offered or music could be offered mm -hmm. um, and you know any way to reduce all of this this the smells why yeah. does a dentist office have to smell like a dentist office right, right. there's all this yeah. aromatherapy stuff right, right? Yeah. And, exactly. and allowing you know our son would love to be able to pick he loves to I'm going to leave it right there, but we have another short, this one's much shorter than that one, um, just diving in. One of the really important things that no one ever told us, if your child is learning through applied behavioral analysis, we mm -hmm. know rewards are provided. Mm -hmm. We know very often those rewards are food, and so right. families, doc dentists, medical doctors should follow up with the families and ask if they can be an advocate for trying to get food out of the reward system right. because kids' teeth end up decayed, they end up with lots of problems because mm -hmm. the foods that they're given for rewards all day long. Right. Mm -hmm. So I encourage dentists and um, medical doctors to, you know, find out what kind of rewards are being used and encourage that it be something other than food uh, to keep the, the mouth healthy. Uh, if we know all these kids, if they have a diagnosis, they have an individualized education plan. And mm -hmm. what you just asked me, Amy, is critical that mm -hmm toothbrushing be on the education plan it should be one of the goals because we know some of the goals include uh, daily life skills right. mm -hmm. and so those things are like the person will learn to dress themselves or mm -hmm. wash themselves toothbrushing should be part of that right. it should be think. on that education Absolutely. plan you uh, so. you know it, it's I'm going to leave that there as well um, and I will I left you the link to watch the full video but that's the clip from unlocking the secrets of autism um, it's from autism New England and uh, she was a, a dental provider a dental assistant but also a mother um, so that was that's how she was able to kind of build this plan out and um, I will drop this in the chat box and just again here let me stop sharing it the video I think it's, it's a great um it's a great video um and again like what she is talking about is um I'm sure is true for you know a lot of families that are here today and families that have um kiddos with you know um, special needs so again thinking about I think we don't always um or you know some dentist office that may not um specialize uh, might not think about you know, all the sensory input that the child is receiving and all of that. So again, as parents, um, you know, really advocating and asking for these things and the idea of a form just makes it so much more, you know, accessible and easier for us to get the information across versus trying to like have a conversation and this is what my child needs and this is what I'm concerned about. Like it's all there in one place. So it's a great, great tool. Yeah, and uh, you know, kind of referring back to the video there, um, a lot of hospitals may have their own version of something like this already in place, and that's great. Um, so if they don't, you know, maybe you could do something like this ahead of time, um, and maybe there's additional areas on this that you would like to include as well. Um, so really, think of this as like a template. Um, so I did just post it there in the chat box for you to be able to download a copy. Um, but as we'll kind of go through here um, and take a look at it. Oh, really, it's a lot of that basic information um, 
kind of referring to the video again, you know, if you were, you know, going into a dentist office, um, it's hard to kind of discuss all this information ahead of time. So um, kind of having it already there um, can be great. So it could be basic information, medical information, um, but kind of moving forward, you know, what about their past dental experience? What were some of the good things? What were some of the things to avoid? How is their oral habits? You know, a lot of these questions that could take a lot of time in conversation. So just kind of having this ready. What about their physical functioning? What about sensation? So are they, you know, anxiety with hot and cold? Um, so really making sure that there's a, an understanding of, of, you know, between the dentist and your individual. Um, maybe they can also include other accommodations as well. So getting to know how well are they, you know, with vision and hearing, are those something that, um, you know, the dentist office should, should you know, think about as they, as they come in here? And really, this is a template um, that can be a great starting place. So um, I would uh, I would encourage that to to maybe use it. And again, I think the section on behavior and emotions is so huge too, because yeah. again, for all of us going to the dentist, office, I mean, some people love to go to the dentist. Um, I don't mind going, but um, but again, for a lot of people, it is an uncomfortable place to be. And then you also, you're very vulnerable. Like she was saying, you're laying back in a chair and you have, you know, the dentist or the hygienist looking at you and they're in your mouth. And so again, there's a lot of vulnerability there. Um, so again, it can create these emotions that kids don't understand or behaviors or whatever, because they are feeling vulnerable and out of control or, or, you know, they don't understand what's happening. So um, I think this is fantastic. Yeah, and it's it's. I think it it really kind of goes back to what works for your family as well. Um, so that's one way. Um, I know families don't always want an additional form to do, um, but I think that's one area that it could be beneficial. Um, some other areas also could be you know making a YouTube video or finding a YouTube video of a dentist session. So this is something that you know could be called modeling, and it could be a great experience to just kind of show you know what happens at the dentist experience through a video. Um, maybe you can make a visual a video visual schedule. So with using pictures, kind of showing what to expect in the progression throughout the appointment, um, but maybe making or finding a social story, um, you know, maybe working together with your dentist's office to create a social story. Um, and we'll go through a couple examples there. Um, and then I, I like this one here, but allowing the child to attend your dentist appointment. Um, again, very similar to modeling there, but bringing your child in there with you, um, you know, showing that, hey, it's good, I can do this, uh, you can do this too. Um, and then also, you know, finding pictures online of the office. So kind of showing them ahead of time, hey, this is where we're going to be, this is what's going to happen. Um, and then and showing them so so it's not, um, or so they're familiar when they, when they get there. Um, Visual schedules. Um, I'm always a fan of, of these tools here, but um, this is something that you could make specific to your situation. Um, but this is one that was from uh, um, Autism Speaks, um, but kind of lays out the different progression of the appointment, like, you know, feet out straight, mouth open. Uh, now we're going to count your teeth, take x-rays, and kind of shows out the different pieces to expect. Um, similar to a social story as well. Um, so a social story can be, you know, a little bit more detailed. Um, it can be as broad or as, you know, specific as your young person needs. Um, but this can be, you know, hey, today I'm going to the dentist. This is what will happen. I will check in in the front desk um, and kind of lays out the progression of, of the day for the individual. Do you use any of these, Allison, with your with your son? So when we initially went to the dentist's office, we did have a social story um, that the office was great about. Um, again, there's there's other kiddos right that need that, so it was more specific to um, the particular practice. Um, so yeah, we did have a social story in the beginning that was helpful. I think social stories in general, like. I use them a lot with my son in a lot of different areas and they are helpful just so that he knows what to expect and can see it visually. So, um, so next we're going to um, talk about sedation at the dentist's office. And again, I have experience with this as well. So I can speak from um, my own experience. Um, so sometimes sedation is needed, right? Um, every child is different, um, you know, especially when we're talking about special needs kiddos, what they can tolerate. Um, and a dentist may recommend the use of um, nitrous oxide or um, conscious sedation, which we've had experience with that, or general anesthesia. 
Um, so those are kind of the options. Um, and sometimes, again, depending on, um, you know, the child's needs, these techniques make it possible for a child to, to receive the treatment that he or she needs. Um, the risk de depends on the kind of procedure that's being done, certainly, and the type of anesthesia that's being used. I can tell you that, um, so I've had um, experience with general anesthesia for my son, not for his teeth, um, but he had to have his tonsils and adenoids removed. Um, and it wasn't a very good experience. <laughs> Again, this is just my own personal experience. He really had a hard time. He was very upset. Um, and so he um, had a tooth that was causing some problems. We needed to have some work done on it. And so um, the dentist's office um, spoke to us about <laughs> conscious sedation. And so again, it's a very light sedation um, that is provided in the office. Um, so, you know, again, it's always hard, right? It's always, I think, you know, for me as a parent, it was difficult to think about, um, to think about, you know, sedation, you know, him needing to be sedated for this, but at the same time, um, the work that needed to be done, it wasn't something that he was going to be able to tolerate um, being awake. So the staff at the dental office, as well as there was a team that came in um, that did the conscious sedation. Um, and again, it was really quick. They were so fantastic with Nolan. Sorry, I just said my son's name, but it doesn't really matter, my son. Um, and so they were just really fantastic with him, making him feel comfortable. He did really well afterwards. So, um, so again, we I have had experience with that. And it, again, in the, the um, situation that I was in, um, it worked really well for him. So, um, um, using a team. So again, um, with sedation, um, Sometimes you may need to, you know, um, have support from others to really help with um, reducing behaviors or anxiety. Um, and so these are some of the, you know, part of your team that may help with that. Um, you know, again, occupational therapists and sensory integration therapists and things like that. Um, again, in my situation, we had a social story. We prepared my son. Um, again, he does have some anxiety. Um, but overall, um, again, the staff that worked with him, um, they were exceptional um, with him. So, but again, utilizing the team that you have to really help support um, during the, during some, you know, a situation or a procedure like this is really helpful. Um, so again, preventative care, I think I mentioned this at one point earlier. Um, it's really important um, very soon on. I think the recommendation here in the notes is um, at one year of age um, is to have a dental home, a dentist. Um, you know, so, you know, you really want to establish that relationship, that ongoing relationship between the dentist um, and the child or the patient. Um, as I mentioned, our dental home, are, they're fantastic. They're very um, again, comprehensive. They're, they make it accessible for him. It's very coordinated. He knows what to expect. He sees the same hygienist most of the time. I think there's another one that he has seen a couple of times, but nine times out of 10, he sees the same hygienist. There are a couple of dentists, but he sees the same dentist. So they just keep it really consistent for him. Um, but again, just preventative wise, you know, starting early, um, brushing with a uh, fluoride toothpaste, again, making sure to remove any fluoride that's left on the teeth. Um, sealants, sealants are something as well that really help to reduce cavities um, and those pits that we all have in our teeth. Some people, um, you know, their pits are deeper. So having sealants um, really can um, eliminate um, the possibility of cavities um, starting in those areas. Um, and then routine care and cleaning. So as I mentioned, just establishing that dental home and really starting um, to have your child um, realize that it is okay to go to the dentist, that um, you know, I can feel safe, I can feel comfortable here, I can have nice clean teeth and, and all of that. So um, again, just um, again, as parents, I think it's important to, to really instill that in our kids as much as possible. Um, and I think it happens by starting early and making it as comfortable and as fun and 
um, as predictable as much as we possibly can. Yeah, that's a nice wrap up. Thanks, Allison. Um, and as we, you know, kind of get to the end here, um, I just want to kind of show you a couple of the resources that um, we have gathered for you. Um, so this first one is, uh, you know, we have a whole list of booklets for you. So uh, at this um, list here, this is put together by uh, um, our our collaborators. Um, but at our MPF office in our lending library, we actually have multiple copies of these booklets here. So brush, 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 uh, the tooth book, which is Dr. Seuss, um, and then Peppa Pig dentist trip. Um, so there's those are some books that are you know more child friendly um, to get them interested in um, you know going to the dentist office. Um, here's an, also a video. Uh, we are not going to play it today, but um, this is a video that kind of breaks down, you know, what are the different tools? What are they, why are they doing this to your teeth? Um, it's from SciShow Kids. Um, so that could be a great example too, is, you know, educating just why are we doing this? What is this saw for? What is this pick for? Um, and teaching, teaching what that's for. That um, exposure, just getting them exposed yeah. to it, whether it's, you know, online or through a book or going to the dentist's office or whatever, that constant exposure, I think is so important. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, we wanted to be sure to, to give thanks to um, University of New England. So their dentist students last two years ago in 2021, um, they were really helpful in us putting this together. So their students had actually put this um, training and we had, you know, really tried to share it with our families because it's such good information, um, as well as the partnership for children's oral health. So um, here are some uh, individuals so that we wanted to give thanks to um, for really developing and building this. Um, but at, before we leave here, um, I did want to, you know, mention a couple other things. I do have a quick survey for you all, um, but if you have any specific questions, uh, we will stop recording and uh, I'd be happy to take them now.